Well, hello everyone and welcome to Insight with Beyond the Headlines and Political Tours. Cuba's economy was already suffering under renewed US sanctions imposed by Donald Trump. Now the effects of COVID-19 and lockdown are compounding an already difficult situation. Here to help us understand what is happening is Professor Ricardo Torres, who's an economist at the University of Havana. And there's a slight delay here, so I'm gonna say hello to Ricardo. Uh, where, where are you talking to us from, Ricardo? I'm talking from uh, Havana. Hello, everyone. Okay, well, that, that's quite a big delay. We'll, we'll, we'll try to adjust for that. We've also got Michael, Dr. Michael Bustamante. Michael is an assistant professor at Florida International University in the Department of History, and he also leads our study tours to Cuba. Hello, Michael. I'm hoping there's less of a delay where you are. Hi, Nicholas. Good to, good to see you and be with you. Excellent. Great. Well, look, we're going to look at what's happening in Cuba in two parts. Firstly, Michael will give us the recent historical and political background, and then Ricardo will look at what's happening to the Cuban economy at the moment as it tries to contain the virus. My, Michael, let's start with you. The relationship between the Trump White House and Cuba, um, those relations are, I mean, are really, really bad. But can you take us a, a back a step or so so that we can understand better what's been happening more recently? Sure, uh, my pleasure. Um, you know, you all are very fortunate to hear from Ricardo in a, in a few minutes, who's going to give you much more of a detailed kind of analysis of the economic picture. So what I thought I'd do is kind of just give um, in broad brushstrokes um, some big picture context about where Cuba and U.S.-Cuban relations have been over the last um, 10, 15 years. Um, uh, there's a, a Cuban-American scholar that I admire very much named Damian Fernandez, who um, something like 15 years ago wrote an essay where he talked about how Cuba's history moves in repeated cycles of desire and disenchantment. Um, it's perhaps uh, a bit of a cutesy alliterative phrase, but I actually think it's, it's quite compelling. Um, and so what I want to try to suggest in the next 10 or so minutes, um, which will fly by, I'm sure, is that um, Cuba, Cubans, Cubans on the island in the United States, um, U.S.-Cuban relations, I think, have been through a kind of a recent iteration of this cycle of desire and disenchantment. That is a cycle of kind of rising hopes. Um, for progress, reform, change defined in any number of ways, followed by a kind of a return to patterns of conflict um, and real questions about where Cuba's future is headed. Um, so can we go to the, the, the first slide? Um, so that man um, perhaps is less familiar to some of you than his brother, uh, Fidel Castro, but that is Raul Castro Ruz. Um, who, and I want to begin this sort of brief historical picture back in um, 2006. Um, in 2006, Fidel Castro fell ill and Raul Castro uh, took his place uh, first provisionally and then officially in 2008 as Cuba's um, head of state. Uh, and the arrival of Raul Castro uh, to the position of head of state, I think really inaugurated um, quite a new period in, Cuba, in Cuba's history. There are some um, particularly in the city where I live, Miami, that are inclined to see any change that happens in Cuba as purely cosmetic um, if it doesn't result in the complete collapse of the island's political system. But Raul Castro was a very um, different um, policymaker, I think, in some respects than his brother or proved himself to be. Um, he began very quickly to talk about Cuba's enduring economic challenges, things that hadn't really been resolved since the fall of the Soviet Union sent the island's economy into an unprecedented crisis, he began to talk about Cuba's uh, economic challenges in really quite unprecedented ways. He talked about the need to uh, downsize the size of the Cuban state. Um, and starting in about 2010, his government began to implement um, really what I would call the most significant um, project of, uh, above all, economic reform, I think, in the last 50 years or in the, in the, the 50 years prior to that. Um, that is since uh, the Cuban revolution came to power. Um, that project of economic reform involved, as I said, downsizing the size of the state, expanding space for the private sector, um, albeit in a kind of a closely regulated sort of way. Um, this was not um, kind of rash privatization of the kind that we might associate with, say, Eastern Europe after the fall of the Berlin Wall, but 
nonetheless, it was significant. And I think a lot of Cubans saw in this moment the, the relative frankness with which the Cuban officials began to speak about economic issues, a sign of hope, right? Um, if you can go to the next, next slide, please. Um, one sign of that was the kind of emergence of, of places like this. Um, this is a friend of mine, Yuri Sigueras, um, owner of a restaurant called Atelier um, in, in Havana. Um, it is not that certain limited forms of private enterprise were entirely unknown in Cuba. Their uh, privately run restaurants like this were allowed um, really starting in the 1990s. But the reforms of the Raul Castro government, again, really starting in 2010, kind of gave businesses like this further room to run and expand. Right. Um, and so you had folks starting to become quite successful um, in Yonis's case, um, catering really to a growing uh, market of, of tourists from around the world. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, if that's possible. Great. So uh, by 2014, um, this process of internal reform and change um, started to intersect with a process of change in the bilateral relationship between the United States and Cuba that I'm sure most of you heard about at the time. Um, Barack Obama and Raul Castro announced simultaneously a kind of an unprecedented deal to begin restoring diplomatic relations and to try to move toward a broader normalization of political and economic ties. Um, and so what happened after that, the kind of mad rush to Cuba, we all have to get to Cuba before it quote unquote changes and there's Starbucks on every corner, um, was very much something that kind of piggybacked onto what was already happening inside the Cuban economy, right? More US travelers, more European travelers, frankly, uh, trying to get to the island before us gringos um, mucked the place up. Um, really helped new businesses like New York's boom. And I think, again, um, uh, led to a lot of um, sense uh, of kind of rising expectations of hope for change, right? There was a sense that if you take away the United States as the external boogeyman in Cuba's internal affairs, that this process of internal reform, as tense as it may have been, um, would have sort of greater room to run. And I think that, in fact, was kind of part of the logic of why the United States decided to pursue normalization when it did. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and you know the, the 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 rush to Cuba was on, right? Um, this was a, a great cover of a of the New Yorker magazine um, that really kind of satirized this moment when when Cuba became all of a sudden in style. It it projected forward to a place a, a, a sort of an image of the future, whereas Cuba was no more than a theme park of um, of the past, a kind of a time capsule, right? Where the Bay of Pigs, um, the site of the famous Cold War era invasion, becomes uh, an attraction called Porky's Cove. Um, where you can go see an animatronic Che Guevara, you can go visit um, Lansky Land, re referencing the, the Meyer Lansky, the famous U.S. mobster who was active in Cuba in the 1950s, right? And, and it was a fascinating time to kind of be in Cuba and see what was happening because in many senses, um, you know, Cuba was becoming a kind of a place to fulfill foreigners' fantasies um, as much as anything else. And I think Cubans found ways to cash in on the opportunities that came of this, but um, there was something also kind of historically and culturally unsettling, unsettling about this kind of mad rush, right? Uh, next slide. Um, you know, one thing that I want to highlight about this period um, in general, and it predates the opening with the United States per se, is that uh, in my estimation, this kind of moment of internal reform mapped onto a process of normalization in the United States helped widen the parameters of domestic discussion um, in Cuba about the island's political future, its economic future, et cetera, right? And so these are just some of the kind of newer um, publications and forums that began to emerge. Some of them, um, like the Center for the Study of the Cuban Economy, that are linked to um, publicly run, state-run institutions like the University of Havana. Others, um, like this magazine at the top left called Espacio Laical, um, was a kind of a publication on current affairs that was put out under the auspices of the, of the uh, Catholic Church on the island, right? And so the parameters of, of discussion widened. Uh, that doesn't mean that um, it was suddenly acceptable to advocate to overthrow the Cuban government, if you're the Cuban government, that you, you don't look kindly on that proposition. But debate was really rich, um, richer than I think I had ever seen it. And, and that, I think, was also a product of this moment of rising expectations. Next slide. 
Um, let's let's go ahead and, and skip skip ahead. This is just um, you know one of the kind of signal moments of of that rising hope when President Obama visited the island in in the spring of 2016, um, appearing on uh, Cuba's most most popular sort of sitcom, a, a, as it were, right? Um, and I think was was the highest moment that that sort of rising tide of expectations would reach. Um, what was interesting was that you know. Almost as soon as Barack Obama took off on Air Force One leaving Havana, you started to sense a, a bit of a counter reaction. There was a, there's a way in which I think looking back as 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 an American citizen, albeit a Cuban American, the visit was almost too successful, um, and and it provoked a kind of a counter reaction, a reaction from some folks inside Cuba Cuba that thought the United States was basically trying to woo us to capitalism um, through sort of sweet talk, right? Um, and you know, by the end of that year, of course, um, we had the election of Donald Trump, um, something that nobody expected, or very few, certainly. I, I, don't, I don't think the Cuban government expected it. Um, and that was followed just weeks later by the death of Fidel Castro himself, right? Um, and it's very interesting because on the one hand, I sort of, you would expect that the, the death of Fidel Castro might sort of mark the end of this kind of legacy of the Cold War or kind of clear space for both Cuba and the United States to sort of move forward into a new future, but coming so soon after the election of Trump, who had campaigned, albeit belatedly, on reversing everything that Obama did, this had the effect, I think, of a kind of refiring the ideological passions. Uh, let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, and so by uh, the spring of 2000, 17, just a few months after Donald Trump had taken office, but Donald Trump, it's worth mentioning, whose organization, both in the late 1990s and um, by some accounts, in or just before he took office, had people on the ground sniffing out for business deals, <laughs> decided um, that he was, uh, he came to Miami, gave a big speech in which he announced that he was canceling the Obama deal, quote unquote, um, with Cuba. Um, and really, rhetorically announced a kind of a pivot all the way back, uh, a commitment to kind of unwinding everything that the Obama administration had tried to do. Um, suffice it to say that that was more bark than bite at first. Um, that rollback was not so complete at the very start, but in the last few years, it has become uh, almost uh, as complete as one can imagine. Uh, and US-Cuban relations are at their worst point in, in recent memory uh, for me, uh, for, for sure. So next slide. Um, this is just a sense of kind of um, some of the measures that uh, the Trump administration has put through, um, summarizing where the Obama administration sort of used executive authority to kind of increase the ability of U.S. citizens and residents and Cuban Americans to travel to the island in a more unfettered way than ever before. The Trump administration has sought to clamp down on that. One thing that I think is important to mention, uh, particularly in 2019, the sort of what, what the administration has called the maximum pressure campaign has been linked to a policy on Venezuela, um, which is obviously another uh, very tense situation. Um, and, and so the idea, there's a kind of a, a dual domino theory that's taken effect, right? Um, the Trump administration seems to believe, um, despite you know, 50 years of, of evidence about the um, lack of utility of sanctions in the Cuban case, it seems to me, that if you can clamp down on both Venezuela and Cuba, you can sort of pry them apart and, and, and prompt both political systems to fall. Um, next slide. So I know I'm probably running up against time. So Nicholas, just tell me when- You're good, you're good, it's fine. Shut, shut my yap. Um, another thing that is, that is significant about this moment of a kind of a shift back to the politics of conflict with, uh, between the United States and Cuba is that this coincides with the rise you know, some would say finally uh, of, a, of a kind of a post Castro era in terms of Cuba's political leadership. Um, that is uh, in 2018, Raul Castro, after having taken office again, officially in 2008 as Cuba's head of state, uh, steps down. He remains the head of the Cuban Communist Party through next year. That's not um, an unimportant position, obviously, in the Cuban system. But a younger guy, uh, Miguel Diaz-Canel, became the head of state, someone who kind of rose through the ranks of the Co Communist Party. Um, and, and, you know, I think in many ways um, was handed a whole series of sort of hot potatoes, right? The Cuban economic reform effort, and I'm sure Ricardo will talk about this, 
in some ways had stalled. Um, they sort of did the easier things first, harder things they didn't get done. Um, and so these things have fallen into a, a relative newbie's lap who doesn't have the same sort of historical legitimacy, perhaps as a Raul Castro to kind of bring everybody in the Cuban system, which is not a monolith, um, you know, behind a plan of reform. Um, what's interesting about Diaz Canel too is, um, you know, his slogan lately, or not lately, since really um, taking office, has been uh, "Somos continuidad" or "We are continuity." Right. This is a direct attempt to arrest any uh, sort of speculation that there was that Diaz Canel could be a kind of a closet Miguel, Miguel, Mikhail Gorbachev. Right. Um, he is transmitting a message and has been that we are not a break from the traditions of the Cuban revolution of the leadership of Fidel and Raul Castro. We are, we, are, we are continuity. The question of course is continuity of what? Continuity of what coming on the heels of a predecessor, Raul Castro, who as I just said, put in place some of the most significant economic reforms that Cuba has seen, right? Um, Cuba is not the same place now that it was 10 years ago. It's certainly not the same place that it was in 1965. So, so continuity, I think, is, is the only slogan of the government is a little bit of a misnomer. Of course, things are changing. Cuba is always changing in ways big and small. The question is um, how and, 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 and in, which, in which direction. Uh, next slide. Um, so I would say that, you know, thinking about this kind of arc of desire and, and disenchantment that I began with, um, 2019, I think is, is uh, you know, if 2016, the visit of Obama is the sort of the peak of, of hope and expectation and perhaps overinflated expectation in retrospect. To this past year, you know, I, I had thought that we had hit sort of the trough, right? This is when the maximum pressure campaign for the Trump administration um, really intensified. Um, it is a, a period in which the pace of reform internally in Cuba seems to have, seem to have kind of um, slowed for, for, for sure. Um, Cuba did approve recently a new constitution that is significant, that has significant potential in some of its language for economic reforms moving forward, but some of the most kind of um, significant economic reforms potentially that one could uh, expect have kind of been pushed down the, the, the legislative agenda for, for a few years from now. Um, so my sense of being in Cuba in 2019 was a really sense of kind of, you know, we're going back to this sort of old patterns of, on the one hand, um, uh, conflict with the United States that doesn't get us anywhere, uh, and a sort of internal um, lack of clarity as to sort of where uh, politics and economics are, are moving. Next slide. Um, and just one aside before I get to my last slide, I believe. Um, is that one thing about the Trump era that I think is significant um, is the rise in Miami of, this has been frankly a very surprising development. Maybe I should take a step back first. One of the things that made it politically possible for the White House in 2014 to broker a deal with Cuba to normalize relations was the fact that the Cuban American community, which for so long has influenced, exercised a lot of influence on US Cuba policy, um, that community had become much more diverse. It had become composed of more recent Cuban migrants since the 1990s that are much more plugged into the, their homeland. They go back and forth, they visit. Um, it's, not a, it's not a perfectly fluid situation, but it had become much better. Um, but you know, lately in Miami, I think on the, on the wings of, of the Trump phenomenon, we have seen the emergence of sort of newer voices that don't represent the kind of Cuban exiles of the 1960s or their children, but are in fact folks who left Cuba in the 2000s and are extremists um, in, in the right-leaning direction, right? Um, and are, are, as you can see in this guy's t-shirt, uh, this is Alexander Otaola, who's a kind of a well-known influencer in Miami, um, who has an incredible amount of influence uh, and is an opinion maker on social media. You know, he's appropriating a kind of a, a Trump slogan. Um, uh, as part of his political agenda. This is a real obstacle, I think, to moving forward and getting back to a place of a more um, constructive relationship between both sides. So next slide, and I, and I believe it's my last one. If I'm not, don't, don't kill me. Um, actually, it's not my last one, I lied. I, this is maybe the penultimate one. But, but just to say that um, as a result of all of this uh, renewed conflict, right, with the United States, um, maximum pressure and intensification of sanctions, um, a declining situation in Cuba's very crucial ally, Venezuela, 
uh, a lack of clarity about where the economic model is going. We saw over the course of 2019, periodic shortages, uh, lines like you see in this, in this photo to get goods, right? So people were already before coronavirus, people were already sort of saying perhaps a bit tongue in cheek, are we going back to a new special period, the special period referring to the immediate crisis in Cuba after the fall of the Soviet Union in the 1990s? And next slide. Uh, let's go ahead and skip. I, I, I lost count of my slides, it seems. It seems. This is the last one. Um, so just to say, already before coronavirus hit, things were very uncertain, very unclear, very difficult. Uh, and I think, you know, coronavirus is, is, um, has magnified all of that uh, in, in a huge way, right? If people were talking tongue in cheek about, are we ha you know, entering a new special period? Now, uh, I've seen some of Cuba's you know, reputable economists um, t talking about this seriously, right? This is not just a phrase. Uh, thinking about Cuba as potentially on the verge of an, a crisis as deep, if, at, if not deeper, than that which Cuba experienced in the 1990s. Um, there's also a question, will this crisis in its magnitude finally force uh, the Cuban system to kind of implicate or, or implement, excuse me, some of the, the deeper necessary uh, economic reforms that it, frankly, I think had been putting off because they're difficult. Um, so that's where we are um, in terms of the broad picture. I apologize if I went on too long, but I'm sure Ricardo can provide much more detail on the nitty gritty of the economic situation, both before COVID-19 um, and obviously since the pandemic began. Mike, that's absolutely fantastic. I mean, I, I love the way that you could sort of identify trends within Cuba and within the United States and then how they sort of reinforce each other as sort of the reverberations on, on both sides. I think it's really, really interesting. Ricardo, we're going to pass straight over to you. You can give us the background um, in terms of the reforms that are ongoing and what the situation is now. I'll leave it to you now, Ricardo. Thank you. So, hello, everyone. Uh, I would like to say that, unfortunately, my slides are not as uh, funny as, as Mike's, are actually very boring, uh, graphs and, and text and so on. So I, my apologies for that, uh, but let, let's move to the content so that there is something that we can say about the, the, this uh, uh, talk. So next slide. So I would like to divide my, my uh, insights into two main moments. Uh, let me first say a few, a few words about what, is it, what the economic situation was in Cuba before the, the, the coronavirus. Um, then I would like to say a few words also about, about uh, how the country has uh, dealt with, with this uh, health emergency. Uh, and finally, we'll talk a little bit about you know, what's going on in terms of the, of, of the, of the economy, what the government is, is, is doing, and, and you know, some final uh, remarks. Uh, so in this uh, number, so you can see how Cuba's uh, GDP growth has been decreasing in the last few years. So Mike said a, a bit about Cuba's reforms. I have to say that there were big hopes in Cuba uh, when this uh, reform program started in, back in 2010. So actually, it started in 2008 when the government is, uh, said that Cuba was importing too much food and then he started leasing out some small plots to uh, private farmers and cooperatives and, and, and other, uh, even state companies, uh, agricultural state companies. So this is important because we will we'll go back to the food uh, issue uh, as, of, uh, as of now. So again, there's been nearly 12, uh, 13 years of reforms. So. And I think also that compounded with the, with the process that Obama started in the last uh, two years of his administration. You know, it created a lot of hope and a lot of expectations in the, in the Cuban people. Nearly everyone was very hopeful at that time. I recall those days very well. Uh, I was hopeful too, I have to say. Uh, and even in my most pessimist uh, 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 hours, I wouldn't imagine that we will be the situation we are today, frankly speaking. I mean, in terms of the pandemic, but also in terms of Cuba, US relations, and the results, the outcomes, the main outcomes of the reform. So again, Cuba's economy was doing very bad already before the pandemic. This is very important because many of the issues and the problems we, are, we have now 
uh, are coming, but you know, there's, there's, there's a long way uh, uh, for them. So, uh, and you know, one specific uh, uh, point that I want to make is a large part of those problems can be singled out in the balance of payments. So Cuba has uh, always suffered for a, as long as I have my memory, uh, starting the Cuban economy, at least after the revolution, from a chronic foreign exchange uh, shortage. Uh, so when that strikes, so everything else uh, falls apart because we need that foreign exchange to import, to pay our debt, and also now to pay the foreign companies working in, in, in the country. And so we started having uh, pretty much associated with the other factors that I'm going to discuss in the next uh, slide. So we started having suffering from, from acute scarcity of foreign exchange, and that actually disrupted uh, the, the functioning of the economy in many significant ways. So in this graph, you know, look at Cuba's foreign trade. Of course, foreign you know, exports are not the only way for Cuba to make, for, to, 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 to make foreign exchange, because uh, there are also remittances. Uh, that are a, a, an important part of that. But there you can see uh, how, what the situation is uh, as of now. You know, there has been a significant decrease in, in, in Cuba's exports. And here we have uh, a, a, some of the main factors behind that uh, quite bad performance, I would say. Uh, of course, there is a big, a, a big discussion in Cuba. Mike, I'm sure, is aware of that. Uh, around uh, how to weight all of those facts, you know, what is less important. So I mean, Kiva always say, you know, U.S. sanctions are to blame for everything. Some others say, no, U.S. sanctions don't matter a lot at all. So I'm pretty much somewhere in between, I think. Uh, but um, so you have, you know, some, so some situation with, you know, some, some, some of Cuba's uh, main products like sugar and nickel, I'm sure there, were, there, are, there could be a few others there. Uh, a very important aspect here or thing here is the economic crisis in Venezuela. Venezuela became in the early 2000s Cuba's main uh, trading partner. And it, it's important because it's Cuba's biggest market for Cuba's uh, uh, for, for medical services, but it's also uh, Cuba's main supplier in terms of uh, uh, energy. So the demise of Venezuela has had a, a big impact on Cuba's economy, has disrupted uh, economic activity in many important ways. So then you have uh, U.S. sanctions. Mike talked a little bit about that. I won't go into that in, in, in detail. But again, you know, the things that we are seeing these days were unimaginable uh, uh, five uh, years ago. So I think it's a, now we have the worst situation between the two countries in at least three or four decades. Uh, and I you know it's escalating in, in, into new territory, for instance, the activation of Title III of the House Court tonight. So I, I, I actually, I do that regularly in Cuba to, you know, foreign companies that operate in the country. Uh, the, some, some of them have commercial relations, some others have investments in Cuba, and they are very scared when it comes to the U.S. sanctions, because they see that there is no real limit to what this administration can do when it comes to some countries, well, Cuba, Venezuela, maybe Iran is, is, is another example. So it's, it's, it's a pretty bad situation. So we should not underestimate the actual impact of, of uh, U.S. sanctions. Then uh, we, uh, we have all of the problems associated with uh, Cuba's reforms. Uh, as I said, there were big hopes, but essentially everything that mattered for Cuba's economy, we couldn't accomplish in the last uh, 12 uh, years. Uh, reforming state companies, uh, tackling shortage of, of, of domestic food uh, production, unifying the currency and exchange rate, uh, expanding the private sector to areas fully use their talent and their education. I could name many others, but truth is that uh, uh, we didn't do, do, do enough. And importantly, um, I would say that 
uh, the, 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 so the tourism boom and the big expectations around the United States created a sense of uh, uh, false safety in terms of, well, you know, tourism will provide uh, the lion's share of Cuba's uh, foreign exchange for many years to come. So this, there is a virgin market, the United States that we can tap into right now. So we don't really have to care about anything else. So it's really to reason something that will uh, enable us at least for a, a decade or so to uh, uh, generate enough uh, uh, resources. That was clearly not the case, and now we are in a, in a, in a completely different situation. Um, so let me now go to next slide, please. Uh, uh, you know, now the coronavirus is striking, you know, it's affecting the world in many important ways. Let me emph just emphasize, you know, some of the aspects associated with, you know, the impact of the current crisis into Cuba's economy. So I want to highlight, you know, you know we have uh, uh, some, some products. Cuba is, is a very small open economy, so very dependent on trade, international trade. Uh, and we have some of these signature products. You know, all of them are, are suffering uh, in, 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 in different ways. Uh, you know, rum, cigars, nickel. And so there is a big question mark around, you know, how fast the recovery will be. So we don't know that. So some were very enthusiastic about the V-shape uh, 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 recovery. Now most, most experts think that that is not going to happen. So the, the, the second area is tourism. Of course, we were just talking about that. Tourism became a very important sector in Cuba. So and let me say here that in the case of tourism, it's not only important for the Cuban government or for the Cuban state. Tourism creates lots of jobs in Cuba, and there are many private uh, businesses that cater to international visitors, and they are suffering now a lot. You know, international uh, arrivals have gone, to, have gone down to zero, essentially, in the last uh, two months. So, uh, you know, there were lots of spillovers uh, around tourism, and, you know, that is affecting the population, the ordinary people, uh, a lot. Um, there are big hopes about opening the borders again in July, but we don't really know. We're not sure about uh, uh, about that. Then remittances, uh, most of them coming from the United States. You know, you know what the situation is in the U.S. in terms of unemployment. Um, it's, it's 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 impossible that it doesn't have an impact on the ability of many you know, hundreds of thousands of Cubans that send money regularly to the family in Cuba, even if they want to, because there is a big discussion or, you know, there is a, this is kind of a myth that says that Cubans are very loyal to their family, that they, uh, they are even willing to sacrifice consumption uh, for the sake of having money to, to, to set. But truth is that the situation there is very unstable as of now. We don't know what is going to happen. And uh, that is a factor that we have to take into, into account. So two other things. One is that Cuba is not a member of any uh, uh, major international financial institution. So Cuba will not profit from any of the emergency programs that some of them are putting together. So that is something that we have to bear in mind as well. Um, and in the, in the special period, Cuba, you know, one of the factors that allowed Cuba to escape the big disaster after the collapse of the Soviet Union was that the war was growing and Cuba somehow in, integrated again into that economy to reason for the investment and so on. This time, at least over the short term, that is not uh, here with us to help Cuban economy to move forward. Next slide. Uh, Cuba well, is well known. So it, we can say, I'm just going to stop. We can um, we've got um, uh, the our time is running slightly short. We've got about a, just over another sort of 20, 25 okay. minutes to go, and the people's questions are going to be coming in. So maybe if we could just pick up the pace with the next slides, because I know that people are also going to want to know about. Um, you, you we're looking at the bigger picture here, and we're looking at the numbers, but also if we can just talk about the day-to-day -day situation. I know you're about to talk about the, the health situation just now. Um, but if we could try and just pick up the pace and then I know you'll be able to come back to these questions when people ask questions as well. 
Sure. One more, two, two more minutes, and I can squeeze everything else. Uh, uh, so one thing that I want to say, you know, Q is well known for its uh, health uh, um, capacities. Uh, I think the country has dealt very well with the with the emergency so far. So there are important human resources out there. Um, and of course, for Cuba, it's very important because as a country that is very dependent on tourism, we want to make sure that visitors feel safe when they decide and it's possible to, you know, restart international uh, travel again. So it's, it, it, it's very important. We can go to the next slide. Um, and well, let's keep this. Um, so there we'll see some numbers essentially to show that, uh, you know, compared to most of its, its peers in the region, Cuba is doing very well in terms of, uh, you know, numbers and so on. Next slide. Um, same thing. Next slide. Uh, so now let, let me say a few things about, uh, about this. These are some of the uh, measures that the government has introduced to deal with the economic uh, impact of the, of the pandemic. So, I mean, this situation will exacerbate, no doubt about that, Cuba's balance of payment problems. The government has already asked the Paris Club uh, members to defer payments until 2022, and this is only the start of this uh, situation. There is obviously a tendency here for the government to concentrate resources so that it is able to deal with the, with the pandemic. So rationing has been extended uh, so that the government, uh, uh, you know, had the chance to reach everyone with at least some basic uh, product, minimal amounts of, of, of basic products. And, and as I said, you know, it's very important for Cuba to make sure that it's safe health-wise so that international tourism and other uh, uh, activities can resume uh, uh, shortly. So I would like to say that unlike in other situations, so one thing that the government has to pay more attention to right now is the fact that all, not all Cubans are in the same economic effects of the pandemic. Cuba used to be a very egalitarian society, no longer. Uh, this is something we seem to have um, lost you there briefly, Ricardo. I don't know if you if um, you can still hear us now. Um, but I think the last point he was just saying, maybe Michael, we can pick up on this, is that um, is, uh, unlike in other. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you now. Yeah, go on. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so unlike in other uh, crises before, big crises, I mean, now there is also a quite big private sector out there. Uh, so I, you know, going back to one of the my, uh, things that Mike said uh, at the end of his presentation, I do believe that the impact of the pandemic will make the government more flexible when it comes to the reforms. We are already hearing the, the, the president saying that we have to speed up the implementation of some of the things that have been shelved uh, around the reforms. And I think a key part of that will be a new space, new room for Cuba's private sector. So I look forward to the next months in Cuba. I think it will be fascinating. There is a big discussion in the country around what our, uh, our, our options are when it comes to policy making and so on. So thank you. So we can go back to some of these issues during the Q&A part of the uh, session. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. That, that was a, a fascinating overview. And I think just, um, I've got tons of questions and I know people are going to be asking questions here. Don't forget to put your, write your questions in the Q&A box down below and then we'll come to you and we can open your microphone up and you can ask the questions directly. Um, I, I was very struck that when we went, went on our study tours in Cuba, that there were a very limited number of jobs that you could, or co companies had a very limited number of 
uh, areas in which they could work in. You know, if you had a hairdressers or a restaurant, maybe if you wanted to buy and sell houses, that was you know, very difficult. I think you had to be an architect. So there were a set number of licenses that you could, could have. And I, I, you know, obviously that was very restrictive. So maybe you can talk a bit about that in a second, Ricardo. I'm also particularly interested in um, just what daily life is like. Are people queuing up? Um, are they getting uh, they're getting eggs, you know, bread from the ration shops? You know, um, can you walk around? Is there transport? Is there public transport? I've, I've heard that there isn't public transport at the moment. So I'm very much interested in, the, in, in those kind of things. We've got more questions coming in, and I'll take those in a second. But Ricardo, just tell us about daily life. What what is it like for ordinary people at the moment in Havana or wherever? Okay, yeah, well, that, that actually said about not all Cubans have been in the same situation. And I think it's also different in Havana than it is in other parts of the country. Because I've got family in, 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 in some provinces outside Havana, and scarcity is worse there. So for obvious reasons, Havana is the biggest city, so it's well taken care of, uh, so to speak. Uh, but yes, I mean, now it's nearly impossible to go to a, to a shop without a skipping uh, and a skipping a line. So it's nearly impossible for everything from eggs to flour to uh, bread to everything that is if, at least a, a kind of a short uh, line. Um, and it, there is a lot of instability in supplies. So there is no certainty about you know, going to this shop and finding what you are uh, looking for. Uh, public transportation is not working, so it's completely shut down. So people have to walk or use their own cars or bikes or, or motorbikes or something like that. So that, there is no public transportation in the, in the country. And also there has been a lot of instability in terms of products coming from uh, farmers. So it used to be quite okay in, in Havana, and I know in, in other provinces. Now we are having that situation because plants continue growing. You know, they haven't been affected by the coronavirus so far. So I'm talking about everything from fruits to vegetables and fruits that are so important in, within Cuba's, uh, 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 Cuba's tables. Uh, so that's the situation. I think, you know, uh, um, public services, you know, electricity, water, uh, more or less fine. So there haven't been blackouts uh, so far. So there is a water situation in some areas, but that's due to uh, a drought that is affecting the, the, the country. And I think there is also a lot of anxiety, in my opinion. People are buying a lot more stuff than they actually need. Right. Because so they're anticipating uh, a worsening situation in the coming months. So that's something that I, I, I see everywhere. Um, yeah. Aside from that pretty stable, as I said, health-wise, it, it, it's quite okay. And I, and I think Havana is in, in, in a much better situation compared to uh, other areas. So you also okay. asked about uh, those uh, occupations. And, and uh, so, you know, one of the problems, uh, one of the biggest criticisms that uh, some of us have put together when it comes to the, uh, you know, to the expansion of the private sector in the last uh, 12 years. And in my opinion, this is something, this is one of the most important contradictions around Cuba's economic system today. And reforms were not able to uh, uh, deal with that, which is for a country that has invested so much in education, uh, uh, for a country that has so many talented people, trained people, educated people, uh, the private sector opened and essentially gave people the opportunity to engage in mostly low value added, mm. very basic activities. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, R Ricardo, there's getting... no way yeah. that Cuba can grow faster yeah, if yeah. it's not tapping into its most important asset. In yeah. my opinion, okay. a highly qualified labor force. Okay, great. Um, so, Michael, I think I want to bring uh, you. It's very difficult. I need, it also I need to stop like a lot of frustration. I need to stop you there. Sorry, because I think we've got to try and get some questions in as well. And I want to go back to Michael. 
Um, so, um, my, I think that one, one key question is, I mean, I presume the Cubans must be dreading the prospect of Trump getting another term and, and sanctions continuing, because at least if the Democrats get in, there might be some prospect of things easing up. What, what's your perspective on that, Mike? Yeah, um, listen, um, if, if you think Donald Trump really cares about Cuba, you're, you're wrong. Uh, this is a guy who's flip-flop on this issue. Um, in fact, um, he told Barack Obama in a meeting in the context of the transition that he thought the Cuba policy was fine. But he has been convinced that a hardline um, take on Cuba helps deliver votes, right? Um, and, and not even sort of a mass amount of votes in Miami-Dade County. He won about 50% of the Cuban-American vote in 2016, which was not, um, it was a little bit higher than Republicans had, had gotten in, in the last election, but it wasn't sort of anything like when, when Ronald Reagan was running for office and carried, you know, 80% of the Cuban vote. Um, but the, the Republican Party seems to have calculated that they don't necessarily need to get a huge majority of the Cuban and Cuban-American vote because many Cubans in Miami now um, there has been more migration in the last 15 years than there was in the 1960s, right? And those people are very connected to their family. They send remittances, they go back. It doesn't mean they're happy with everything the Cuban government does, far from it. But they get that when you tighten the screws, so to speak, from Washington, it's everyday people that feel the effect, right? That's, that, that's what happens with the blanket sanctions program that's sort of like our forever wars in Iraq and Afghanistan has just been ongoing and ongoing and there's no real sort of, um, you know, end, end in sight. Um, if he wins again, there's no doubt um, that the sanctions will continue and perhaps intensify. Um, you know, it is very, it's a very grim scenario. Um, you know, perhaps he could surprise us. Perhaps he gets in and says, I don't need to run for election anymore, unless he's imagining becoming a, a perennial head of state, which I don't think is uh, beyond the realm of his um, ambitions. Um, but, but he could say, you know, uh, this guy has flip-flopped on so many things that, that who knows? He, he could, you know, if Cuba in some respects, the smartest thing they could do is offer him a crappy beach and say, here, come and build a hotel. And I'm sure like that, he would switch his opinion. Um, I'm being overly sarcastic, um, but, but, but not too overly sarcastic. Uh, but yeah, I think Cubans on the island are, 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 are I imagine, are dreading that prospect. Um, again, what I think is so striking is that um, as much as there are Cubans, you know, this recent Cuban migrant cohort that's not even that recent anymore, Cuban migrants since the 1990s have been in the United States for 20 years. These are folks that had been on board with the normalization thing or had were more on board and you're seeing a rising amount of frustration and a but, willingness to say, yeah, we got to turn the screws. And I think Cuba's reform, the, to the extent Cuba reforms, that helps solve their problem in Miami, right? Because people in Miami get bitter when they don't see enough progress. And that leads them to be carried to this sort of extreme position that, I, you know, doesn't really help them or their families so directly. Just to pick up on that last point there, then, it, it, if, if Biden were to win, it doesn't necessarily mean that things are going to be suddenly pushed back to the Obama years, and he might be, he might tread more carefully. I think perhaps. I mean, I, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. Um, you know, folks in the Biden camp that are advising him on, for, on Latin American foreign policy were often very much involved in the Cuba-Obama push, right? So, um, you know, there are folks that are working to, so that on the first day of a Biden administration, you, mm -hmm. won't, you won't undo everything all at once because it, it, logistically it's not possible, but um, they'll start to unwind some of the most onerous things that have really hurt Cuban people the most. Um, I do think Biden will be... Um, pressed, uh, you know, to try to carve out his own approach, right? It's, it's no, no president wants to say, I'm just going to go back to somebody else's thing, right? And I think there are, um, you know, legitimate things, criticisms that you can make of the o Obama approach. I, I, think, I think Cuba, Cuba's officials, in my conversations with some of them at the foreign ministry in particular, I think they recognize to a certain extent that they didn't take enough advantage of the opening because they thought there's no way Trump wins, Hillary Clinton's coming in, we're going to continue this. Um, in fact, let's use the, uh, the, the, this rush of American business interest to play that off. Let's get more better deals and better terms of the Europeans who want to get in before the Americans showed up. And what you saw was that after Trump got elected in the last four weeks or so of the Obama administration, there was this mad rush to try to lock this thing down as much as they could. But Trump has proven that what was achieved was far too brittle. And he's been able to wind back, unwind more of it than I think any of us thought. So the ambition of the new administration, I think, uh, Biden has to be to make normalization stick, 
And I think for that, it takes the Cubans too. They, you know, it takes two to tango. And, and, I, and I hope the Cubans have, have learned that lesson. They're, they're, um, they don't want to be seen as sort of conceding to U.S. pressure. They don't want to reform the economy because Washington says so. But they need to do it because they need to do it. And if it has the collateral benefit of deepening a constituency in favor of normalization in the United States, then why not? Right? Yeah. Um, that, that's how I see it. Okay, Let, we, we need to take some questions. So let, let's bring up some um, people's microphones if we can. And, and by all means, put your camera on. That's entirely up to you. Um, I think we've got Nigel Harley, who's got his hands um, raised. So we'll come to Nigel. And then Paul Jackson has got, he's got a couple of questions. I think I've asked one of your questions already, Paul. Um, but if uh, I, I know you've got another good one. So let, let's, um, I've got Paul up there already. So Paul, do you, do you want to go and ask your, your question? Um, and we've got Nigel there, as Nigel's there. So let's take Ni Nigel first, because I saw your microphone open. Nigel, do you want to go ahead? Yes, hello. <clears throat> I'd uh, really ask, uh, like to ask Ricardo about how he sees the impact of both Russian and Chinese support. I mean, my understanding is that probably Chinese support is on the increase, Russian slightly on the decline. But having said that, I understand that both countries have written off very, very substantial amounts of debt in the last sort of five years. So really it's a question of what, who's gonna make the, the big impact. Thank okay, you. Ricardo, we've got to keep these answers short because we've got so many questions to get through in a very short period of time. Go on. Uh, well, there is no short answer to that, frankly speaking. Uh, but I would say that right now, it's, quite, it's, it's, it's the other way around. I think you know, Russia in the last year or so has been stepping up uh, support for Cuba. China has been ambivalent, in my opinion. Um, uh, I mean, China has been constructed to the United States. And so they keep their support, mostly at the political level. But in terms of the economy, not so much. Actually, ch trade with China declined last year. With Russia, it's growing significantly. Russia has also become a key to this destination, uh, I mean, market for, for Cuba. So I think uh, the, the relations with those two countries are different. But let me say one thing. The more pressure the U.S. puts on Cuba, the, the more Cuba will go, will resort to China and, and to Russia for help. That's obvious. I mean, Cuba doesn't have many other alternatives. So I think if someone is to blame for that, that is the United States. Okay. I mean, it, 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 it's been leaving Cuba with its economic linkages yeah. with so the outside got, world. Got no, and and I look forward to see. Yeah. Let, let's, I think, um, Paul Jackson, you asked both those questions. You asked about both about Biden and also about China. So both, maybe both your questions have been, have been answered. But if you've got anything to add to that, Paul, your microphone, you need to unmute. On the tour with you, there you go. when, um, when Castro, Castro died, I, Hi, Paul, good to see I remember you. that, and I, you ran a fantastic tour. That's really Thanks. what I wanted to say, having covered uh, Biden and China. So uh, carry on the good work. Right. So thanks very much indeed for that, Paul. Yeah, uh, fun memories. I have them too. I'm, 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 uh, oh, you are. Oh, yes, of course. You're on the same yeah, trip. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we're, we're, we're meant to be going back in um, December, but um, uh, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, can we bring Fran Hoffman's uh, microphone up? I think we've, we, um, Mike, you've spoken a bit about this, but I find this fascinating because and this is about right-leaning voices in Miami. And I think the thing that I was, um, we've, we've done election tours in Florida, and I'm very much aware that the Latino vote is from Central America, South America. And in my view was that the Cuban voices were becoming smaller, they were becoming less important. Um, uh, and so the, 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 if there was a right wing movement within the Cuban vote, did it matter? But you're actually saying that they've actually become pretty pretty important. Sorry, Fran, I've probably asked most of your question for you. But do you, want to <laughs> you have. <laughs> I just want to add to that. First, thanks to both of you. It's been fascinating. But I saw um, Marco Rubio lurking in the background of one of your slides, Michael, and I wondered if you would talk about his political influ influence. But I'm also, I'm very curious about the new voices that you're talking about and from whence they're coming and what they're looking for. Yeah, 
Thanks for the question. I mean, frankly, it's something that I think some of us are still trying to get a handle on. And, um, you know, there's been a, a fair amount of polling of Cuban American opinion every year. Um, I have a colleague um, at, at my university who polls Cuban American opinion um, every two years for the past 20 years. But polls only get you so far and they don't kind of get you the texture of sort of what's happening. You know, it's all I can say, you know, just to be brief, because I could talk about this forever, is that um, it, it's a very contradictory and paradoxical situation. It is still the case that immigrants to, from Cuba to the United States from the past, say, 20 years are more likely to remain connected to, plugged in with w the country where they came from because they're more likely to still have family there. Um, they're more likely to go to visit, right? Um, but what I think is, is a little bit of become a false um, concept, you know, the Cuban government will often say, well, look, in 2019, in the midst of everything, the maximum pressure campaign, a record number of Cuban Americans or Cubans in the United States came to visit the island because their, their, their ability to visit home has not been touched um, until recently. Uh, and that's true. But the fact that you visit family doesn't mean you're happy with the status quo on the island entirely. Now, some of that opposition is, is deeply rooted in, in, you know, I don't support a one party state and, and that's what Cuba is and, and probably will remain for the foreseeable future. Um, but, you know, I think some of it is also just a product of, um, you know, th there's a whole group of people that you meet and you'll hear the Obama thing had its chance and, and, and nothing happened really. I mean, I would disagree. I think a lot happened, but they don't see enough as having happened to improve the lives of, of, of Cuban, average Cubans. And they say, so we got to turn the screws. Memory is very short. There's no argument being made by these newer hardline voices as to what pressure now will accomplish that it didn't over the previous 50 years. Um, you know, as for the, the, the disconnect between the, the, the sort of declining place of the Cuban vote in the macro electoral picture, and yet the still influence of this issue politically. It is a paradox. Cuba, Miami-Dade County is no longer, like the Cuban vote in Miami-Dade County is, no, is not so important as, as it used to be to winning Miami-Dade County. Miami-Dade County is one of the parts of, of Florida that goes blue to the Democrats for the last few election cycles, clearly. Not because of the Cuban vote, but in spite of it. But nonetheless, um, the sort of, at, lo at the local political level, the people that run this town and this city are part of a deep bench of Republican Cuban American legislators and lawyers. Uh, and they have, a, they have been coming up through the system. Marco Rubio is part of that. Uh, and so there's a disconnect between them, I think still, and the, the sentiment of a lot of the Cuban community, but they hold the power levers. And they believe they can drive enough votes that, that, it, that it's useful for them. Uh, Marco Rubio um, just took over the, the chairmanship of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence because the guy that had it was found doing some funny business with stocks. That puts Marco Rubio within striking distance of his goal, which is to replace Mike Pompeo as Secretary of State. And if Marco Rubio becomes Secretary of State for the second Trump administration, um, we're in for some very difficult times in US-Cuban relations as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the same Marco Rubio who was called Little Marco during the campaign, but you know, he's, he's found a way to quash that beef, I guess. So in any case, hope that, hope that answers some of your questions. That's oh, fascinating, that's thanks so much. So bleak, I think, Fran. It's, it doesn't look very positive at all. Uh, I, I want to. We've got a, time for a few more questions, and then we're going to go into our discussion. And I'm going to prey on you guys. I know we're meant to finish in two minutes' time, but um, I, we, I think we've got a few more questions to go to. Um, Ricardo, if this economic crisis, um, which has been compounded by COVID nineteen, continues. Well, is there a chance of, uh, of unrest, of political stability? What instability? What do you, th I mean, Cuba's been through so much in the past 30 years. Um, it seems very, past 20 years, it's been, it seems very resilient. But what are your worries? What are your concerns? If, yeah, briefly. Uh, <clears throat> my opinion, mm, you know, taking into account what I'm seeing right now, what I see in social media, what, what I hear from my colleagues and my neighbors and my friends, I don't see uh, conditions for massive social unrest in Cuba just yet. Uh, that's what I, what I, what I see. Um, frankly speaking, you know, the fact that the government has been successful at dealing with the pandemic has given the government a 
in the eyes of, of, of a given people. So I don't see that happening. Now, what I do see happening is a small pockets of radicalization and protests, you know, from independent journalists, you know, from other sectors. That it is possible that is happening already, but a, a, a kind of social unrest uh, like the like, like the one you saw in Eastern Europe or some or even in some other countries in Latin America. Frankly speaking, I don't see that. And I think the next uh, challenge for the Cuban government is, as it has been for for so many years, the economy. If the government is willing to embark again on a sustained and sustainable process of reforms, I think that will give them a lot of legitimacy. Because that's really what the Cuban people want. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 my take on on on, on that. I don't see conditions for a uh, massive social uh, un unrest, frankly speaking, okay. not at the moment. I think I think that's very very interesting, and I think I mean Cuba is amazingly stable and resilient throughout all these periods, but one really does wonder in the current situation. Um, Claudia Baker's got a question here, and I think I'll, I'll um, ask it for Claudia, it just may be simpler. Um, she was talking about her visit back in 2013 when there were lots of Canadians going to um, Cuba. Before COVID-19 um, set in, was that still the case? Was there a big, big sort of corridor of people flying in from Canada into Cuba? Ricardo. No, I mean, no, the borders are closed. Uh, March 22nd. No, before. before. Uh, and they remain closed. Uh, so, no, at the moment, Canadians continue coming to Cuba. Uh, it's a very popular destination for, for Canadians. And I'm sure that the Cuban government is looking forward to the day they can open the, the borders so that more Canadians and Europeans can travel to, to the country. Well, th thank you both very much indeed. I think we're, we're, um, we are, we've got the end, to the end of our discussion, the end of our briefing. It's been really, really interesting to have both of you there. So my thanks to you both, um, to, to Michael Bustamante and to Ricardo Torres.